addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Kirsty Black. As the Prime Minister reaches 100 days in office this week, having pledged a government... Having pledged a government marked by integrity, what are his thoughts on the UK being one of only five countries, along with Oman, Azerbaijan, Myanmar and Qatar, that has seen a decrease in Transparency International's Corruption Index score since last year? Well, Mr Speaker, in fact, there's wide, widespread recognition and support for the UK's approach to transparency and, indeed, tackling corruption. Indeed, the most recent report, the most recent report from the FATF body commended the UK for the steps that it had taken. Sir Robert Neil. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I refer to my entry in the Register of Interests. Arts Council England was established to increase access to great art for the population. There's real concern and anger that their current funding decisions do the exact reverse of that on the basis of inadequate evidence and a lack of transparency yeah. in the process. Yeah. Will my right honourable friend meet with me and other concerned members yeah. to discuss the situation in which centres of national excellence like yeah. English National Opera yeah. are at risk of closure yeah. and discuss a way in which we can reform the operations of Arts Council, yeah. which Quite many right. people no longer feel is fit for purpose? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I know that this is an issue that my honourable friend deeply cares about. Uh, he will know that decisions made by the Arts Council are taken at arm's length from government. DCMS ministers have been assured that that process was robust, but I will ensure that he gets a meeting with the relevant minister to discuss this important matter further. But now comes the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his words about the First Minister of Wales and the sad loss of his wife? Everybody, I think, knows just how close they were, um, and I know that he's absolutely devastated um, by her loss at the weekend. Mr Speaker, when the Prime Minister briefly emerged from his hibernation at the weekend, he raised more questions than answers. So, in the interests of integrity and accountability, can he set the record straight? Did his now former chair tell government officials that he was under investigation by the taxman before or after the Prime Minister appointed him? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I appointed the independent adviser to investigate this matter fully. He, he has set out his findings in detail over the weekend, and on receipt of those findings, I took action, and I refer the Honourable Gentleman to the Independent Advisers' Report. Uh, uh, oh, come on. Anyone picking, up a, anyone picking up a newspaper in July last year would have known that HMRC and the National Crime Agency were investigating months before he appointed him. Mr Speaker, the Independent, 6th of July, new Chancellor's finances secretly investigated by the National Crime Agency. The Observer, three days later, 9th of July, revealed officials raised flag over tax affairs before he was appointed Chancellor. The Financial Times, the next day, 10th of July, pressure bills to explain his finances. Is he saying his officials hid this information from him, or was he just too incurious to ask any questions? Mr Speaker, as I've said before at the dispatch box, the usual appointments process was followed with respect to the Minister without portfolio. No issues were raised with me at the time of his appointment, but as the Independent Advisor's report makes clear, there was a serious breach of the ministerial code, and that's why I took decisive action on receipt of that report. Yes, so, in relation to his former chair, his defence is, nobody told me, I didn't know, I didn't ask any questions. Is the Prime Minister now also going to claim that he was the... O Order, Prime, Prime Minister. Mr Gullis, we heard enough last week. I can't hear what you're saying. I might not be able to hear what you're saying, but I can certainly see your mouth moving. It'll be moving outside if it continues. Prime Minister. 
So for his former chair, nobody told me I didn't know, I didn't ask any questions. Is the Prime Minister now also going to claim that he's the only person completely unaware of serious allegations of bullying against the Deputy Prime Minister before he appointed him? Prime Minister. So, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, the, the Honourable Gentleman asks, uh, asks these questions about what was known, and I followed due process, I appointed an independent advisor as soon as I was made aware of uh, as soon as I was made aware of new information, the independent advisor has conducted this process. But if he is so concerned about what people are saying and is so concerned about behaviour in public life, then recently one of his own MPs was forced to speak out because being in his party had reminded her of being in an abusive relationship. And then and then and then his own office was caught undermining her. He ought to be supporting her and her colleagues. But if he can't be trusted to stand up for the women in his party, he can't be trusted to stand up for Britain. Mr Speaker, at the last count, at the last count, the Deputy Prime Minister was facing 24 separate allegations of bullying. According to recent reports, some of the complainants were physically sick. One says they were left suicidal. How would he feel if one of his friends or relatives was being forced to work for a bully simply because the man at the top was too weak to do anything about it? Mr Speaker, I, I noticed he didn't say anything about why one of his own MPs describes being in his own party. And Mr Nipper, when I was made aware of formal complaints, I instructed a leading independent KC to conduct an investigation because I take action when these things happen. But what did he say at the weekend? He said at the weekend that hate had been allowed to spread unchallenged in the Labour Party under his predecessor. He was speaking as if he wasn't even there. But he was sitting right next to him, supporting him for four long years, not challenging. And it is typical of him, Mr Speaker, declining to lead, sitting on the fence, carping from the sidelines, and, and never standing up for a principle that matters. I want to hear both sides, and I'm not going to have, be interrupted by either side. And I'm particularly looking for people who want to continue this, because we will sort it out today. Keir Starmer. Speaker, he's just like one of his predecessors who treated questions about conduct as something to brush off, who thought that ducking responsibility was a perfectly reasonable response for a Prime Minister. At least in fairness, his predecessor didn't go around pretending he was a paragon of integrity and accountability. <laughs> But on that subject, was it a coincidence that the two people who arranged an £800,000 line of credit for the former Prime Minister were both shortlisted for plum jobs at the BBC and the British Council? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, as we addressed previously, the appointments process for the BBC Chairman is rigorous, it's transparent, it's set out in a public code of conduct, and indeed, and indeed, was fully supported not just by an expert panel members, but also by the cross-party DCMS Select Committee, including, including where Labour members described the appointment as impressive. But Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, back. Back, back this week in terms of what is actually happening to the people of this country, he voted, he voted this week with the unions to oppose minimum safety levels. He voted with Just Stop Oil to water down the public order bill. And what do the unions and Just Stop Oil have in common? They bankroll him and his party, Mr Speaker. So while he sides with extremist protesters and union bosses, we stand up for hard-working Britons and school children. After 13 years in power, trying to blame the Labour Party for his failure to sort out the strikes is it's rank pathetic. The Tory party's addiction to sleaze and scandal has done huge damage to this country, and the cost to the public keeps adding up. 
We've got a justice system letting murderers walk the streets. Yeah. Heart attack victims waiting hours for an ambulance. Yeah. An economy that's shrinking quicker than his leadership. Yeah. And even I couldn't quite believe it when I saw that his government is expecting taxpayers to pay the legal fees for the member for Uxbridge defending himself over his lockdown rule breaking. A quarter of a million pounds. Surely even this Prime Minister can put his foot down, stand up to his old boss and tell him he made the mess, he can pick up the bill. Yeah. Mr Speaker, he can't stand up to his union bosses. He can't, he, he can't, he can't stand up for Britain's school children today. And he can't stand up for the women in his party, Mr Speaker. We're getting on, we're halving inflation, we're growing the economy, we're reducing debt, we're cutting waiting lists and we're stopping the boat. While he can't even figure out what he believes in, we'll keep delivering for Britain. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that the integrated care boards must prioritise more access to new GP services, especially in places like South Derbyshire, where new housing estates are being built at the fastest rate in England, and in particular on the new brownfield development of Drakelow? Well, Mr Speaker, the Government is committed to increasing the number of doctors in general practice and last year saw the highest ever number of doctors except a GP training place. The BMA are consulting each year on the funding of GP services and my honourable friend will know that the NHS has a statutory duty to ensure sufficient medical services, including general practice, in each local area. Leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yes, Mr Speaker, I'd like to pass on my condolences and indeed those of my party to the First Minister of Wales and also to the family, friends and colleagues of firefighter Barry Martin, who so sadly lost his life following the blaze in Edinburgh just last week. Mr Speaker, we've just marked the three-year anniversary of Brexit and we've learned... So I... They'll, they'll, not, they'll not be cheering in a moment, Mr. Speaker, because we have learned, we have learned three, we have learned three things. The UK's trade deficit has grown. Yep. The economy is being hit to the tune of 100 billion pounds yep. each year, and of course, and of course, we know that the UK's economy is expected to be the worst performing of all advanced nations. Does the Prime Minister still believe that the UK can afford not to be in the European Union? Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, if you actually look at it, since, the, uh, since, since Brexit, the UK has grown exactly the same as Germany has, uh, Mr Speaker. But uh, not only that, we are taking advantage of Brexit to deliver for the people across the UK, whether it's the fishing and farming communities of Scotland, whether it's through the two new free ports that we've just announced. But, Mr Speaker, the difference between his party and ours is that we respect referendums. Yeah. Mr Speaker, let's, let's be clear. Taken together, 2022 and 2023 are expected to be the worst years for living standards since the 1930s. And the economy is expected to perform worse than sanction hit Russia. So as the Brexit ship sinks with the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition at the helm, does he blame those Scots who want to jump aboard the independence lifeboat? Well, uh, but, m Mr Speaker, the, the, num the number one factor that is impacting people's living standards is inflation caused by high energy prices as a result of a war in Ukraine, Mr Speaker. It's got nothing to do with Brexit, and that's why the government is taking significant action, supporting every family with £900 this winter. But what I would say to him is, rather than obsess about constitutional arrangements, focus on delivering for the people of Scotland. That's what we will do. David Johnson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The baby daughter of my constituents, Gary and Sarah Andrews, died just 23 minutes after uh, she was born. When they asked questions about that, the parents were told that these things happen and that um, if they had to listen to the concerns of, of every mother, they would be overrun. Thanks to dogged campaigning by 
Gary and Sarah and other parents whose babies had died avoidably, Nottingham University Hospital's trust was found to have systemic failures and last week was given the highest fine that's ever been given for um, failings in maternity care. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that this case, this situation, has to serve not just as a watershed moment for having the highest standards of maternity care, but also that when things do go wrong in something like an NHS trust or another public body, they have to be open and honest and transparent yeah. about their failings so that people can get the truth and not have it hidden from them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm very sorry to hear about the tragic case my honourable friend raises, and I know the whole House will join me in sending our thoughts to Gary and Sarah. We want to make sure that the NHS is the best and safest place in the world to give birth, and the NHS has taken steps to improve, but cases such as the one that my honourable friend raises highlight that more must be done. Nottingham University Trust is receiving support from the expert maternity improvement advisers, and nationally the Royal <coughs> College is implementing the recommendations from the independent Ockenden report, together with £127 million of extra investment. But my honourable friend is absolutely right. When situations like this do arise, transparency is paramount so we can seek answers and make improvements. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. It's nearly right. 10 years since the tragic death of <coughs> nine-year-old Ella Roberta, the first person ever to have air pollution listed on her death certificate. Yesterday's Environmental Improvement Plan pledges to improve air quality, but the government's targets of a 2040, that's a whole generation away. I don't think that's fast enough, and neither does Ella's mum, Rosamond Adu Kissy Deborah. So on her mum's behalf, will the Prime Minister agree to meet us both to discuss the life-saving measures in a new proposed bill called Ella's Law? Oh. Mr Speaker, it's obviously very sad to hear the case of Ella and our thoughts and hearts go out to her family. With regard to the legislation, as uh, my Honourable Friend Environment Secretary will make a statement later today, we are confident that the measures we are putting in place are not only legally binding, but also world leading in tackling air quality. The record over the past 10 years is one where every single air particulate has been reduced with binding targets to continue reducing them in, in future. And indeed, the Environment Act makes sure that we have the capability, accountability and ambition we need to make all the effective interventions to drive down air pollution. Dr Liam Fox. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, compared to what some people seem to believe, 82% of the jobs in our economy are in the private sector, compared to 18% in the public sector. Most of those private sector jobs will be in small businesses, the small businesses that we will depend upon for wealth creation and prosperity in the future. Will my right honourable friend consider bringing in a small business test across government so that every regulation we produce, every bit of legislation we produce will help not hinder small businesses? And does he share my ambition that every white van man and woman and every white a white coat tech worker in this country will regard the Conservative Party as their natural champions. Yeah. Well, my, uh, my right honourable friend is absolutely right, and this government is proud to join with him in supporting small businesses. Uh, I'm pleased to tell my honourable friend that we do have a small business test to consider whether the impacts of regulatory changes will disproportionately affect small and micro businesses. I will make sure that we are applying that test rigorously, and he'll be pleased to know that many small businesses will benefit from billions of pounds in business rates reductions this coming financial year, as well as our annual investment allowance, which at a million pounds is the most generous tax incentive for investment for small businesses anywhere in the world. And McLaughlin. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this morning, just two hours ago, I launched the APPG on prepayment meters. Yeah. I did so because most people on these meters are on very low incomes, and yet they pay more per unit of energy than the Prime Minister does. They pay higher daily standing charges than the Prime Minister. They're automatically disconnected from their energy supply the second they run out of money. And, and 
perversely, right now, record numbers of people are being forced onto them by the energy companies. Yeah. Can the Prime Minister even begin to imagine how terrifying that moment is when the lights go out and everything shuts down? And will he agree with me, rather than reading out, please, what he's got written in front of him, will he just agree with me that what I've just described is completely, completely unfair? Yeah. 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 Well, uh, Mr Speaker, the Government does recognise the challenges facing those on prepayment metres, and that's why the Government is taking action. The Secretary of State has set out five very specific points on prepayment metres, energy suppliers are being spoken to to make sure that they treat customers with the respect and flexibility that they deserve, and finally, Ofgem uh, have announced that they are launching a review into supplier practices in relation to prepayment metres. But all of this, Mr Speaker, comes on top of the considerable financial financial support that this government has provided to help people with their energy bills, with more of that support being targeted at the most vulnerable families in our society. McLean. Yes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. After 8,000 residents of Redditch signed my petition to bring back chemotherapy to the Alex, the Trust reversed their decision to leave it at Kidderminster. Yeah. 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 A fantastic win for our town. And I'm grateful to the local acute trust for listening so carefully and changing their mind. So does the Prime Minister agree with me that it's right that the acute trust can change its mind on the provision of maternity and <coughs> paediatric services so that women can give birth in our wonderful town of Redditch? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend has clearly been a fantastic advocate for the Alex and for her constituents. We have awarded £10.5 million to the local trust and I understand that some of that funding is being used to improve maternity and paediatric services at the nearby Worcestershire Royal. Uh, my honourable friend will know that these operational decisions are being made by integrated care boards and I know that she will continue to make her views known. Andrew Gwynn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr yeah, Speaker, yeah. if I had a pound for every time I'd heard the Prime Minister's weak excuses, I'd be able to pay the Chancel former Chancellor's tax bill because it was last June July that it was reported that the National Crime Agency had investigated the Right Honourable Member for Stratford on Avon. Right. The then Prime Minister knew, the media knew, yeah. Yeah. we all knew. Yeah. It's inconceivable that the current Prime Minister yeah. didn't know. Yeah. So why did he choose to ignore it? That's right. yeah. Mr Speaker, I appointed an independent advisor to fully examine the matter, establish facts and, and report back. That, that's the process that the party opposite called for. That's the process that we followed. John Penrose. Uh, Mr Speaker, two years ago the Prime Minister commissioned me to propose 30 ways to boost growth and make Britain the most competitive country in the world. So far we're underway with about half of them. But some of the most valuable, like reforming ponderous and expensive utilities regulators or building on our international lead in open banking haven't moved at all. So will he meet with me to discuss how to channel our inner Nigel Lawsons and unblock the arteries of our economy with low-cost, pro-competition, supply-side reforms? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, my honourable friend has a long track record in advocating for and implementing policies that increase our competitiveness and reform the supply side of our economy. His report was fantastic and I look forward to meeting with him to discuss them further and help drive growth in this country. Catherine West. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker ambulance waiting times are out of control. My, constituency, uh, my constituent contacted me regarding her 93-year-old mother who lay collapsed on the ground at home for 17 hours and then queued for 13 hours to get into the hospital. And yet on Monday, the Prime Minister said he had his fingers crossed that ambulance waiting times would be reduced. Does he really think that's enough? Yeah. Yeah. No, well. Mr Speaker, if the Honourable Lady actually looks, we published on Monday a comprehensive plan to reduce wait times in A&E and with ambulances, uh, it, backed with more funding and reform of the system, more beds, more ambulances, more staff. And, and, and indeed, Mr Speaker, it was a plan that was warmly welcomed by all of those working in emergency care and the ambulance services. They recognise that this plan will deliver reduced waiting times and improved care across the country, including in Labour-run Wales where there are some things we can benefit them from. Jerome Mayo. Mr Speaker, if you grow up in Norfolk and you want to be a dentist, the nearest place you can train is in Birmingham 
or in London. So it's not really surprising, is it, that in Norfolk we have a dearth of dentists, whether it's NHS or private. We also know that where there is a dental training school, more dentists end up working locally. So will my right honourable friend agree to look again at the benefits of establishing a dental training school alongside the excellent medical school at the University of East Anglia? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend will know that there are around 400 dentists with NHS activity in Norfolk and Waveney, but he's right, the centres of dental development build on the existing local infrastructure to help retain and recruit dentists, and I would advise him to encourage his local integrated care board to look at proposals for one of those centres in his area. Mary Kelly Ford. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister once said that he didn't have any working class friends. So we may not be aware that today, that today half a million hard working people are on strike, including in his own constituency. Yep. Tory Britain isn't working. Is the Prime Minister going to get a grip and negotiate with working people, or does he intend being remembered as the PM who silenced and sacked? hard-working nurses, paramedics, yeah. teachers, real workers and firefighters in a cost-of-living crisis. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker when, it, when it comes to teachers, we've actually given teachers the highest pay rise in 30 years. It includes a 9% pay rise for newly qualified teachers and record investment in their training and development. I am clear that our children's education is precious and they deserve to be in school today being taught. And actually the party opposite would do well to say that the strikes are wrong and we should be backing our school children. Dr Neil Hudson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Sadly, suicide is the biggest killer of young people under 35 in the UK. My constituent, Andy Airy, along with Tim Owen and Mike Palmer, are the three dads walking. Andy, Tim and Mike each tragically lost their precious daughters, Sophie, Emily and Beth, to suicide and have campaigned tirelessly through charity walking for suicide awareness and prevention to be included in the school curriculum. I've been humbled to support them, including joining them on their UK walk as they came through Penrith, with their petition which is due for parliamentary debate on the 13th of March and with my early day motion which has support from right across the House. Would the Prime Minister join me in paying tribute to the three dads? And would he meet with me and the three dads to discuss suicide prevention and ultimately save young lives in the yeah. future? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, of course I pay tribute to Andy, Tim and Mike, especially for channelling their own personal tragedies into such positive action to prevent this happening to other families. That is inspiring and they deserve enormous credit. Uh, the government is taking action to improve the provision of mental health services for young people in schools and colleges, uh, but I would be delighted to meet with him and Andy, Mike and Tim to discuss what more we can do. Ian Blackford. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that welcome. <laughs> Ordinary people didn't need to hear an IMF forecast to understand that the UK economy is the worst performer amongst the leading nations in the yeah, world. Yeah. They live with it every day. People know their energy bills are through the roof. They know that 750,000 households face defaulting on their mortgages yeah. while house prices fall. And they know that food prices are rising at a record rate of 16.7% as of today. The Prime Minister is 100 days in office, his party 13 years in power. In all that time, does the Prime Minister ever reflect that the only thing that the Tory party has been good at is pushing people into poverty? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh, Mr Speaker, it, it, uh, it is wonderful to hear from uh, the right honourable gentleman and uh, I'd love to see him in his place. What, what I would say is that we're continuing to deliver for people across the UK, including and in Scotland. He mentioned poverty. Poverty today lower than when the Conservatives first came into office. Inequality lower than when the Conservatives first came into office. And the number of people in low pay, the lowest on record. Yeah. 
Th thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, today in my constituency there is a great sense of shock and disbelief following last night's horrific dog attack uh, that killed a four-year-old girl. Uh, the police investigation is still going on and it wouldn't be appropriate to uh, speculate on the circumstances. But it would mean a great deal if, on behalf of the House, the Prime Minister could send our condolences to the family and to the community and to thank the emergency services for dealing with the situation with their customary compassion and professionalism. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, I thank my honourable friend and send my condolences, and I'm sure the whole House's condolences, to the girl's family and the community after this horrific incident. And I join him in thanking the emergency services. They have responded rapidly and professionally, and I know that my honourable friend himself will be supporting them and his constituents during this difficult time. Christine Jardine. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. This past weekend... <laughs> Can I blame the painkillers? Pain <laughs> Apologies, Mr Speaker, and thank you. Um, this past weekend, I uh, visited a charity which was hosting an exhibition in my constituency about metastatic breast cancer, um, which claims 31 lives each day in the United Kingdom. And the women there asked me to convey at the first opportunity to the government the need for more awareness, more support, more research and more drug availability. Can I ask the Prime Minister if he will do that, if he will help to bring that support? But also, I have written to the Scottish Government asking for their support. If in his next meeting with the First Minister he would mention it to her. Oh, Mr. Mr Speaker, can I pay tribute to the charity that the Honourable Lady mentioned and for the work they do. She's absolutely right. Awareness is key in tackling and identifying breast cancer symptoms early. Uh, one of the reasons why we're investing more in diagnostic and uh, screening tools to make sure that we can detect more cancers earlier and treat them and, and ultimately save people's lives. I, I would be happy to pick up this particular topic with the First Minister when I next speak to her and ensure that we are working together to improve cancer services for everyone, regardless of where they live in the UK. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. In the United Kingdom Government's negotiations with the EU regarding the Northern Ireland Protocol, would the Prime Minister kindly confirm to the House that the sovereignty of the United Kingdom and its four nations will not be compromised. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. 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 Speaker, I can give my honourable friend that assurance. I know this is something that he cares passionately about. The implementation of the protocol is having an impact for communities in Northern Ireland. Uh, that's why it needs uh, to be addressed, and that's what we are attempting to do through constructive dialogue. But the goal in that must be to ensure Northern Ireland's place in our precious union. Kim Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Since the election of the fascist Israeli government in December last year, there has been an increase in human rights violations against Palestinian civilians, including children. So can the Prime Minister tell us how he is challenging what Amnesty and other human rights organisations are referring to an apartheid state? Well, Mr Speaker, the, the Honourable Lady also failed to mention the horrific attacks on civilians inside Israel as well. Uh, and it's important in this matter to, to remain calm and urge all sides to strive for peace. And that's very much what I will do as Prime Minister and in the conversations that I've had with the Israeli Prime Minister. Sir John Hayes, final. Mr Speaker, in uh, 2016, the British people had the wisdom and foresight to take back control from foreign, from foreign lawmakers. And when they, when they did so, they believed we were taking back control of our borders. Yet since that time, we have faced wave after wave of illegal migration. So will my right honourable friend, without further delay, bring forward the necessary legislation 
to turn back the tide and fulfil the promise that was made to the British people then. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend makes uh, an excellent point. That's why one of this government's five priorities and promises to the British people is indeed to stop the boats. We will introduce new legislation that makes it unequivocally clear that if you arrive in this country illegally, you will not be able to stay. We will swiftly detain you and remove you to your own country or a safe third alternative. That's the right and responsible way to tackle this problem. Yeah. Complete questions. Well, at the end of Prime Minister's questions, let's just bring in our political editor, Beth Rigby. Uh, Keir Starmer really pushing the Prime Minister mm. on Dominic Raab and, not, and on allegations of I mean, what you, within the party. Yeah, Jane, what you saw there were there six questions, two on Nadeem Sahawi, two on Dominic Raab, two on Boris Johnson. So it's all about... Uh, Starmer trying to press home allegations of sleaze and scandal and then making the point that the Prime Minister isn't standing up to that. And that was not comfortable uh, for Mr Sunak, particularly around the issues of Raab, because even if you can argue that the Boris Johnson stuff isn't the responsibility of Sunak or indeed the Nadim Zahawi, as Rishi Sunak claims, that this was happening and people were not aware, according to the independent investigation around Mr Zahawi's tax affairs, the issue about Dominic Raab is straight at his door because there are accusations that the Prime Minister was informally made aware of some of these allegations about you know, unacceptable behaviour by Mr Raab and he didn't act on it. We're going to go back to the Commons because an urgent question from the we Labour Party the about the Hillsborough Paul report. Yes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. So the Home Secretary, the Home Office, will make a statement on the National Police response to the Hillsborough Families report. Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm extremely grateful to the Honourable Member for his question. I know this is a subject with very profound personal resonance for him, and I pay tribute to him and many others for the work they have done and continue to do in memories of the victims of this awful tragedy and to ensure the lessons are learnt. The Hillsborough disaster was an awful, devastating tragedy. Its impact continues to be felt to this day, especially by the families and the friends of the victims. I'm sure the thoughts of the whole House are with them. It is imperative that lessons are learnt from the experiences the Hillsborough families have gone through, so I am very grateful to Bishop James Jones for the report he produced highlighting a number of points of learning for the government, for the police and for other agencies. As my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, said yesterday during the debate, um, the government is fully committed to engaging with the Hills, Hillsborough families prior to the publication of the government's formal response. And I can also say um, that in particular since arriving in the Home Office uh, uh, two or three months ago, um, I've asked for this work to be sped up and we, are expecting, and we are expecting it to come out in the course of this spring. Uh, Mr Speaker, the National Police Chiefs Council and the College of Policing published their response earlier this week. I welcome their commitment to avoiding uh, repeating the mistakes that were made and for the apology which they gave. They made clear that strong ethical values, the need for humanity and humility in the police response to public tragedies is critical. And one of the commitments they made rightly earlier this week is to substantially strengthen and update their own code of ethics in relation to these issues. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, there have been some very important steps made uh, by the government in the last few years responding, which, which have addressed a number of the points, but not all of the points, which Bishop James Jones uh, published. Uh, for example, in February uh, in 2020, uh, a suite of police integrity reforms were introduced on a statutory basis via the professional standards for policing, which included, critically, a duty to cooperate with inquiries. Other initiatives have been taken forward to support bereaved families already, uh, including the removal of means testing for exceptional case funding to cover legal support for families at inquests, which broadens the scope and access for families, and refreshing our guide to coroner services for bereaved people so it's more tailored to their needs and imp it provides improved guidance for others involved in the inquest process. The Inquiries Act 2005 also provides a statutory process for funding legal representation requests. 
Last year, the Home Office also established an independent pathology review um, and additional consultation with the families um, is now taking place. Um, a consultation has also taken place on retaining police documents, which was the subject of a recommendation made by the Bishop, and the Ministry of Justice have also consulted on establishing an independent public advocate. Those steps, I think, are important. They go a, a long way towards improving the situation, but they don't cover everything, of course, that the Bishop recommended, which is why we will be responding in full. Our intention is to do so this spring, but after, of course, um, full and deep engagement um, with the families concerned. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Government is committed to making sure these lessons are learned following this awful uh, tragedy, and I, as the newly appointed um, Police Minister, will do everything I can to work with uh, members across the House, but particularly those members representing the affected communities, to make sure this does now happen quickly. Yeah, Since that awful day on the 15th of April 1989, 97 people died directly from the actions of South Yorkshire Police and other agencies, including the emergency services, the FA and CFL Wednesday Football Club. <coughs> With families destroyed and survivors traumatised, so traumatised, that many have since taken their own lives. The lies and smears from the establishment cover up, who acted with impunity and arrogance because they could, meant justice was never delivered for all those who died and suffered since. In 2017, Bishop Jones delivered a report, the patronising disposition of unaccountable power, a report to ensure the pain and suffering of the Hillsborough families is not repeated. Shamefully, we have not yet had a government response to his recommendations to a report commissioned by the then Prime Minister, the Honourable Member for Maidenhead. Bishop Jones yesterday said the delay was intolerable. His recommendations are, in essence, the hills below, which so many in this place and outside have since campaigned for. We must always remember these recommendations are to ensure no other community go through the suffering we have endured since 1989. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They hopefully future-proof the ability to gain justice. Yesterday, we finally had the response to the report from the College of Policing and the National Police Chiefs Council. This was the first apology from the police force for its actions since the disaster 33 years ago. For so many, including myself, it's far too little and far too late. Yesterday's recommendations from the police did not go anywhere near far enough to change the culture we came up against in our quest for justice. So I ask the Minister, will this Government do the right thing for future generations of our nation and implement a Hillsborough law containing Bishop Jones's recommendations with immediate effect? The families and survivors of so many disasters and consequent state cover-ups deserve nothing less and these injustices must never, ever be allowed. If a Hillsborough order had existed in 1989, we would have had a, would have had a chance of justice for the 97. Without it, we had none. Okay. Minister. Well, look, I fully understand and respect the sentiments that the Honourable Member just so powerfully uh, expressed in his, in his remarks. In relation to the timing um, and the, the, the years that have passed since the Bishop's report, um, for much of that time, there were ongoing legal proceedings, and of course, uh, nobody wanted to prejudice those for obvious reasons. That accounted for about four years, from 2017 uh, to around about May of 2021. But 20, about 21 months have passed uh, since then, uh, and I agree that this does, the government response uh, does need to come out quickly. It's something that, since my appointment um, a couple of months ago, um, I've asked to get sped up. And I want to try and make sure that happens uh, this spring, but following, of course, consultation with the families that obviously is extremely um, important. And that will include uh, responses to the point, um, points that he, he made. Um, but I would just reiterate that the, um, the statutory changes made to the professional standards for policing in 2020 uh, do include a duty of cooperation on police officers in relation to inquiries, which was, is a very important uh, thing, as, he's, as he said uh, already. Um, but he is right, we do need to get on and respond comprehensively um, to the Bishop's um, recommendations, which is what I'm working on. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The apology from the police is, of course, welcome. But, frankly, it would have been far better for them to have done their job properly on that fateful April day 34 years ago. If they had done so, 
Families of the 97, and indeed the whole Liverpool community, would not have gone through the suffering and anguish that they've had to bear over the last 34 years. Can I say first to my right honourable friend, saying vaguely that the government's response will be available this spring, I do not think is good enough. Five years on, the government must publish its response. But will he agree with me that one of the elements that can be put in place to help families who, if sadly such an event, a tragedy of this sort happens in the future, is the introduction of what was promised in the Conservative Party manifesto in 2017 of an independent public advocate? And will he commit now that the Home Office will not put any barriers in the way of the work of the Ministry of Justice to introduce such a body? Um, well, I thank my right honourable friend for her question. I mean, as I mentioned, um, for about approximately four years since the publication of the report, there were uh, ongoing uh, legal, criminal legal proceedings which uh, nobody wanted to prejudice. But as I have said in the House, and as the Home Secretary said uh, yesterday, uh, we do want to now get on and uh, quickly respond comprehensively to the Bishop's report. Uh, in relation to the independent public advocate, a measure being um, worked on by the Ministry of Justice, as the Right Lady um, said, a consultation, a public consultation, has taken place um, on that, and the response is being uh, worked to in the usual way, um, but it's happening at pace. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I uh, thank my honourable friend, the member for West Derby, and also all of the Merseyside MPs for pursuing this and securing this urgent question? 97 people lost their lives as a result of what happened at Hillsborough on that terrible day 34 years ago. And we remember the football fans who never came home. And we must also never forget the shameful cover up that followed. The Hillsborough families have fought for decades against obfuscation and lies to get to the truth. And everyone hoped that Bishop John James' report would be a turning point, and I welcome the work the former Home Secretary did to commission that report. But it is five years on. The police rightly have said that it was police failures that were the main cause of the tragedy, and police failures have continued to blight the lives of families ever since. But to do so just five years on is takes too long, and it makes it even more shameful that there is still no government response to what has happened. The Home Secretary yesterday said it was because of active criminal proceedings, but those finished 18 months ago, and the work could have taken place even while those proceedings were ongoing. It's September of 2021. The government announced the response will be published by the end of the year, and we are still waiting. The Home Secretary said yesterday the government was engaging with families, but what engagement has taken place? Has the Home Secretary met with them? Has she met with the bishops? And I have to say, where is she today? Because previous Home Secretaries have shown the respect to the families and to the appalling ways in which they have been wronged by being here to respond. And it is a devastating failure of responsibility and respect to them not to be here to respond. The key measures that were, we need a government response have been well known. On the duty of candour, on the public advocate, on the elements of the Hillsborough law, the Labour Party stands ready to support that law to get it into statute. So will the government now commit to support that Hillsborough law and to recognise what the Bishop has said about it being intolerable, the pain to those families not to have a response? The report was called the patronising disposition of unaccountable power. Would he recognise that that is exactly what this continued delay yeah, will feel exactly. like to so many families and survivors now? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Um, well, well, I entirely look, agree with the Shadow Home Secretary's um, opening comments about the appalling impact, and indeed of other members, uh, the appalling impact this has had on the families of those who so tragically lost their lives. I took my own son to a, um, a Crystal Palace football game just a few weeks ago, and uh, just thinking about how awful it must have been to be uh, trapped in those circumstances um, is, is too uh, just a terrible thing to contemplate. Um, the police have apologised, as the Shadow Home Secretary said, for the terrible failings uh, that took place on the day and, and in the years um, subsequently. It's right that they've um, apologised to the families and to the country as well. 
Um, in relation to the timing, I, I said already um, there, there were legal proceedings ongoing. It has been 18 to 21 months since those have concluded, um, which is why, since I was appointed, I've asked for this work to be sped up, and it will be concluded um, very rapidly. But I do just want to, and it will respond to all of the points in full, um, but I do just want to, to repeat the point I made earlier, um, that a number of things have happened already. She mentioned the independent public advocate, where a public consultation has taken place, which as she will know from her own time in government it is, generally speaking, a prelude to um, action. And on the question of cooperating with, and on the question of cooperating with um, inquiries, the statutory professional standards for policing introduced in 2020 um, did introduce um, that requirement, but the response does need to cover all of the points, and that will happen very soon. Mr Robert Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I listened with great care to my right honourable friend's statement, but I do have to press him on the independent public advocate point. As my right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, said, uh, the Ministry of Justice, which I had the honour of leading, uh, and worked with her and the honourable member for Garton and Halewood, uh, is in a position to go ahead with this policy. The consultation was five years ago. What's stopping the government from doing this? Minister. Well, um, thank you, Mr Speaker. I mean, as I um, said before um, to, to others, including the former Prime Minister, um, the consultation has, um, as my right honourable friend said, taken place. Um, the, usual, the usual processes in government um, are going on... Well, Chris Foot there, to, there um, for the government that, answering questions, um, uh, being pressed and, uh, by uh, Ian Byrne, the Labour MP for Liverpool, Justice, also Vet Cooper, Robert Buckland, and also Theresa May from his own side as to why the government has the not responded five the years on from the report on the Hillsborough tragedy. Uh, he has said that since he has come into position, uh, he has asked for the government response to come out quickly and it will come out, he said, this spring. Couldn't be more specific than that, but he said that the families of the victims will be consulted before the government's response is given, but he said that there is a time frame it would be happening this spring. Theresa May says, saying vaguely, she does not think it is good enough. She would like the government to uh, release its statement sooner. But that the latest on the Hillsborough report. Well, away from the House of Commons, uh, let's bring you these images uh, of central London, uh, the scene where education workers are rallying against controversial government anti-strike laws. Uh, it is also the biggest day of industrial action in more than a decade, with teachers, among others.